You see that? Yes, we can. All right. So I'm Dave Kinney, um, aerospace engineer at NASA Ames Research Center. I'll be talking about VS Fiero. Split across two different talks today. Um, so first one here is going to talk about theory and then a little bit of validation. And then later, uh, after a little bit of break and you get to see some GUI stuff, um, I'll talk about some of the latest work that's going into the, the software here. So outline, uh, quite a few things to try to go into. Going to try to go into a little bit more detail this year. Uh, I was asked to do that, so I'm happy to do that. Um, so just talk about geometry. Uh, this some of the options we had when we were looking at you know doing VSP arrow. Uh, talk about you know our process of using vortex rings and the trailing weight process. Uh, boundary conditions. Propellers come up all the time, so that's part of the code. So a little bit of discussion about those. Um, then talk about basically how we actually solve the linear system that comes out of this formulation, a little bit about weight reaction, and then a little bit talking about force and moment calculations. Um, so geometries. Um, all the geometries for VSP are going to be defined in terms of triangles, quads, and polygons. So from OpenVSP, we can get that. Um, well, there's more than one, more than two paths, but the, the two that we have supported right now. Um, basically using the DN beyond to generate what we call vortex lattice models, and we'll talk about what that means, and then using the comp geom for doing uh, panel model analysis, and we'll get more by panel model and vortex lattice models in a bit. Um, I know Rob's sitting there thinking, but there's a third option, and that's basically the mesh generation. Um, you can use that uh, to generate a triangulated mesh as well, and you can fit that into the panel model analyses. Um, but generally speaking, I'm recommending using comp jump right now, just um, for a number of reasons. Um, so the gen um, Rob probably talked about this yesterday. Um, so the geometry is approximated using various uh, lifting surface approximation. So for the fuselages, we basically drop the fuselage into what we call a cruciform model. Basically, there's a longitudinal and a lateral geometry approximation for the fuselages um, that carry over basically the plan form from both the longitudinal and lateral uh, views, as well as things like camber and twist of the fuselage. So we're lifting surfaces, I'm stealing uh, Andy Hong's potato chip model idea. Basically, we capture plan form, twist, a hydro camber, et cetera. Um, so in both of these, thickness is, is ignored. Um, the final mesh is going to be a mixture of quads and polygons um, and tries. And we typically refer to this as a VOM, i.e. a vortex lattice model. Comp is the second path that we have that's supported. The uh, geometry that you generate in OpenVSP is intersected. It's then trimmed. So all those overlapping components that you had, wings, bodies, tails, canopies, whatnot, um, they're all intersected. They're all trimmed. So anything, any parts of those bodies and wings and tails that are inside are, are thrown away, and you end up with just the wetted area, wetted surface of the vehicle uh, with you know some funky looking triangles at the intersections. Um, the final Mesh is going to be a mixture of tries, quads, and polygons in general, again, and we'll refer to this as a panel model. Um, so there's really no approximations going on here in terms of the geometry. What you started with in OpenVSP is what you're going to end up with, um, barring any you know, issues with the trimming process. Uh, you know, the plan form, the geometry is all there, and the thickness is all there. So just to note, both the GenGeom and the CompGeom models uh, result in computational meshes that are made up of tries, quads, and in general, inside polygons. And so you know, we, we hinted at this initially that it would be really nice if the aerodynamic solver made direct use of these unstructured meshes so that we don't have any other geometry processing that is, is really necessary. So we allow all that geometry work to go on in OpenVSP. And, and from the get-go, that was kind of our, our goal, was to, to move all the geometry 
uh, generation, whether that be the DGEN geom path or the comp geom path, or perhaps using the 3D gen, uh, mesh generation path, all that is done in OpenBSP. And the geometry as it comes out is exactly what's going to be used by the solver. So I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but you know, there's a whole bunch of different aerodynamic solver options out there. Um, and in general, you know, any of these, there's other codes out there that, that apply these different methods you know, in terms of solving either the full stokes equations or the Euler equations, if you just want to look at inviscid uh, solutions. Of course, we've been talking about panel methods and VOM methods, but starting at the top, you know, full number of stokes is basically, like I said, the real deal. You're conserving mass minimum energy over the entire domain. Uh, it typically requires a volume grid, um, and this is uh, generally computationally expensive. Um, move down to Euler, or my favorite, the full potential equations, um, you're basically ignoring the viscous effects. And so if you're solving the Euler, you're still conserving mass minimum and energy. Um, if you're solving for potential, you're just really doing conservation of mass. Um, the other two are implicit. You still require some kind of volume grid, and it's still relatively expensive. Um, although oil or solvers are, are, are very competitive nowadays. Um, moving down, um, panel methods generally they're incompressible at, or at most linear compressibility. Um, they're really just conserving mass directly. Everything else kind of falls out of the formulation. Um, you know, typical panel methods, there's no volume grid, so you just need to have that surface geometry and find that distribution of doublet sources, vortex rings, or some combo that basically satisfies the flow tangency boundary conditions on, on, your, on your geometry. And, and typically, you know, if you code them right, they're, they're much faster than either oil or another stokes. And then finally, the, the VOM methods, vortex lattice methods, basically the same thing as the panel methods. Again, you can do uh, distribution of double -width sources, vortex rings, some combo. Um, you're just really conserving uh, mass directly with these type of formulations. But the big thing here is that you're ignoring thickness in general. Um, and you've reduced the geometry down to just plan form effects alone. Um, so you end up with you know, that potato chip type model. Um, but again, you know, compared to the panel methods, that simplification means that it's much faster. And you know, like Rob was talking about yesterday, um, you know, you apply the right tool at the right time. Um, so panel methods and the OM, uh, vortex lattice methods. Uh, and I'm going to go through all the details, but generally in our process, we're going to use vortex rings. I'm going to distribute those over the entire vehicle geometry. And the strength of those vortex rings will be determined such that the velocity at the centroid of each vortex ring is tangent to the local geometry surface. So you basically want the flow to be tangent, not going through the surface of your geometry. So that gives you a boundary condition. You can use that for each vortex ring to solve for the strength of that vortex ring, um, such that the flow basically goes around and not through your vehicle. We'll shed wakes, and they'll be modeled as vortex lines, leaving the sharp trailing wedges of wings and possibly bodies. Um, these, the strength of these vortex lines are determined by enforcing the coded condition, which basically means that the flow leaves the trailing edge smoothly. Um, and then the location of these vortex lines, uh, typical vortex lattice or panel methods will have these vortex lines just coming straight off of the trailing edges and going off to infinity in a straight line, or perhaps you know, at something like angle of attack over two. Um, we will iterate on the locations of those um, vortex lines, those trolling wakes such that they end up being uh, full field streamlines. And then finally, of course, we'll make pretty pictures because that's what we do. So just to, to give you an idea of what we're talking about, so the pulled this model out of the hangar quite a while ago. Uh, I'm not sure who built it up, but it's a Skymaster. Um, it's also a Skymaster. It's a, uh, you know, a fairly complex geometry in terms of what's there. Um, if you run it through the comp geom, you end up with a panel model geometry that's shown on the upper right, um, which, you know, as I said, basically it's, it's a mixture of quads, triangles, and in general, inside of polygons, and all the thickness and all the geometry that we modeled up is, is included in this model, in the panel model. 
the lower right is the vortex Silos model where everything's been dropped down to basically just plant form and things like twist and camber effects. Fuselage is reduced down to a cruciform body. Wings are basically, I don't say plot plates, but potato chip type models. If we zoom in and look at the panel model, we can kind of see what's going on there. We've got a mixture of quads, tries. Hey, Dave, can I pause you for just a minute? Is uh, your presentation by chance um, shared in a strange aspect ratio or anything? Because I think we're missing maybe a bottom inch of your presentation. Rob, do you see that as well? Yeah, there's a little bit trimmed off the bottom. Um, so yeah. you're, you're trimmed a little. It's it's not terrible, though. All right. Well, I mean, yeah, this this yeah, I have no control right now. This this the aspect ratio on this mo this monitor is not sixty nine, so I don't know. That's okay. I mean, we're getting the gist of it, so uh, let's go ahead and just roll with it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I've been told the bottom part of the presentation is getting clipped a little bit. I apologize for that. Um, so moving on. Uh, and the panel model, if you move and zoom in, you can basically see a mixture of quads, tries, and then up there, uh, you can see there, there's actually a number of inside polygons as well. The initial weight geometry, um, just straight trying lines coming off the trying edges and on the few solids and a few places. As I said, these location of those trying weights would be iterated in the solution process. Vortex lattice model, again, all the thickness effects are removed. We just end up with cruciform approximations for the wings and for the fuselage and, you know, potato chip type models for the, the wings and tails. And then just to zoom in of that. Um, and, you know, I, I purposely put in this just to show, I mean, you've got the struts there that are supporting the wing. And, you know, in this vehicle, because we've gotten rid of basically the fuselage and replaced it with a cruciform, those struts are now kind of flying in the wind um, on one end. And so these are kind of details that the user has to be aware of. So um, you either have to, you know, decide to keep those there or get rid of them or, you know, in some way adjust the model so that the vortex autos model represents more uh, what you're trying to capture. And then again, this is the initial weight moving coming off. In this case, just wings, tails, no wicks um, are coming off the body in this vortex on this model. So vortex rings, I've been talking about triangles, quadrilaterals, polygons. So in general, our geometry for the solver is going to be modeled up as a list of triangles, quads, and polygons. So those Polygons could be inside, so they, they might, you know, in general be triangles or quads, or they might be, you know, 5, 10, 20 sided polygons. It, it, the solver really doesn't care. We try to keep two triangles and quads and try to keep them uh, basically kind of regular shape quads and triangles. Polygons usually are just going to show up in places where on the comp beyond, where we have intersections between components. And we had a lot of sliver triangles that are then merged into, uh, you know, inside of polygons. So to basically do the panel method for each one of those, each one of these vortex rings, we need to calculate what the induced velocity is from each one of those rings, given basically a vortex ring defined by the shape of that ring. Um, and we use the generalized Biot-Savart law, and um, you probably have seen some of this if you've taken arrow, basically, where you've got something like an infinite long vortex where the points one and two are going off to plus or minus infinity, um, and you'll see that the tangential velocity looks like some kind of gamma circulation strength, basically over R. Um, and, and so if you wanted to calculate the induced velocity at a point P, you could just look at the distance, normal distance from that line to point P. So this has been generalized to include linearized compressibility effects. So M infinity here is the three stream Mach number, um, and gamma is still the circulation. 
Um, there's a number of ways to include compressibility in the panel or vortex lattice code. This is the way we've chosen. Um, so we basically, you can integrate this thing directly for a line segment from one to two and come up with closed form solutions for the velocity that's induced by a vortex filament from you know points one to two induced velocity onto point P. Um, for subsonic flows, the integrals will behave. Um, this integral actually extends to supersonic flows, so we'll show some results for the vortex lattice model, um, where you can actually use this formulation for supersonic vortex lattice uh, solutions as well. Um, but there's some mathematical complexity that you have to deal with. Um, talk to me here. So the solution process. So again, we've Distributed. We've covered the entire vehicle. It's defined by you know these vortex loops, um, in general triangles, quads, polygons, and at any given loop, we need to calculate the induced velocity from all the other vortex loops and the trailing wakes. So the velocity at some vortex loop I, and that's generally at the centroid, the center of that vortex loop. We to calculate the total induced velocity, we need to basically calculate the induced velocity from all the other loops, as well as, as loop I um, on, at that point, and the induced velocity from all the wakes at that point. So to that induced velocity at that point, we add in the free stream V infinity, any rotors, um, the, actually, the weights is double book hit there, so I should have deleted that. Um, and so the sum of all that velocity is um, dotted into the normal at that point of that vortex ring should be zero. That's just the tendency boundary condition. So for every vortex loop, we have a boundary condition that we can apply. And the solution depends on the strengths you know, the velocity at that point dotted into the normal at that point, the, the total velocity depends on this, this solution from all the other vortex rings. So if you write this out, you end up with a linear system. You know, typically AX equals B, here it's A gamma equals B. The gamma is going to be our vortex strengths for each of the vortex loops that we have. B is this right hand side, it's basically that equation up there, V dot N equals zero. Is that right hand side. And we can solve this entire linear system for the vortex rates. Um, and then we now know the strength of the vortices such that we'll import the change into the condition. Um, and it's just noted in the bottom that the, the strength of the weight vortex rates, um, they're determined by applying the cutting condition, which basically generates according to that are directly tied back to the strength of the vortices on the surface. Um, so the wakes don't actually introduce additional unknowns. They're basically rewritten in terms of the strengths of the vortices of the body. So we have this huge linear system that we need to solve. Huge is all relative. It might, if it's a small vortex lattice, it might be a 100 by 100 system, or if it's a panel, it might be you know, a 20,000 by 20,000 system. Um, but we have to solve that linear system one way or the other. We can do a direct solver, so we can do like an OE decomposition of that matrix A, solve that. That gets expensive real quick. The solution path is going to go like N cubed. Um, iterative solvers, uh, the path that we've chosen, there are many different iterative solutions out, techniques out there. Um, if you've done this in the past, you know, the simple ones are things like Jacobi method, gauss idel method, approximate LU methods. We've chosen to use a preconditioned GM red uh, with a matrix free evaluation of the residual um, and then with a preconditioner, which we'll talk about. So like I said, we have a, a linear system, AX equals B, that we need to solve. Um, we can redefine this uh, in terms of a residual vector. So the residual is just B minus AX. So if we solved for this system and we plug in X, that satisfies AX equals B, the residual is by definition zero. We can iteratively solve this linear system by iteratively forming new solution vectors X of I, such that the residual is driven to zero. So if we guess some initial solution for X, 
um, and we plug it in, we'll get some initial residual R sub I, right? And unless we've guessed exactly the right answer, then that X of I will give you a residual vector that's not identically zero. So the trick is to come up with a process that given that new residual R sub I, how do we come up with a new X of I plus one such that the residual as we iterate in this from I goes from one to hopefully not infinity, that the residual tends towards zero. So we want to choose an iterative solver, obviously that we don't need an infinite number of iterations. Um, and more to the point, we only need to really solve this until we get a good enough solution. So that residual doesn't have to be exactly zero. It just has to be small enough that the errors are bounded and within ex acceptable values. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this chart, but we use GM res to do that. Um, and so, yeah, copy pasted right from their original paper, some shots and salts. Um, basically, you start off with an initial guess, x sub zero, you calculate that residual, and then you use that residual basically to build up a subspace of orthogonal vectors and you minimize the residual over that subspace and that gives you a solution X. And you keep doing that until your residual has satisfied some convergence tolerance. Um, so the interesting thing to take from this though is that this whole process, really what the GMRS algorithm cares about is the residual vector. It really doesn't care about the matrix A. So if you can give it the residual, uh, you don't need to give it A. Um, so if you have a way to calculate the residual without actually calculating A, that's perfectly fine. So uh, this iterative solution, one thing, you know, we, we said we had AX equals B. We can try to improve this, the, the conditioning of this linear system by preconditioning it. So if we have AX equals B, we can pre-multiply by some preconditioner P, the inverse of that, P inverse AX equals P inverse B. You know, if we were to choose P to be A, then we exactly get the solution. We need A inverse A is the identity matrix, and then A inverse B, basically that gives us X. And so we would have a direct solution if we were to actually just use P equals A, but that would be expensive. Um, and then, so that, and it would defeat the purpose of, of doing any kind of an iterative process. So the trick is to choose P so that approximates A, but that calculating P inverse is inexpensive. Um, so we can precondition this linear system with some kind of you know, good preconditioner, but you know, not P equals A. So there's a whole bunch of choices out there, right? And so uh, we've got a couple of them in the code. Um, if you choose P to be the diagonal of A, this is just basically Jacobi iteration. Um, and so if you have a diagonally dominant matrix, then P, you know, just using the diagonal of A to be P, you know, it could, would generally be a very good approximation to P inverse. We can choose P to be some combination of low and upper triangular portions of A. This would end up being something like gauss idel or SSOR, symmetric successive relaxation. Um, we can choose P to be in an approximate LUD composition of A. So you could do an exact LU composition of A, and that would be expensive. So if we can do what we would call an approximate, where you make some approximations of how you actually generate that LU to make its computation fast and cheap. Like I said, VSPRO actually provides all three choices above with basically the approximate OU matrix method being the fault. So evaluating the matrix A, uh, just say no. So we don't actually evaluate the matrix um, in the AX equals B linear system in VSPRO. We don't need to. GM res only needs the residual. So all we need is B minus A gamma. So if we can calculate B minus A gamma without actually explicitly calculating and storing this huge matrix A, right? Remember, if, you, if you've got a panel method that's like 30,000 panels, that matrix is 30,000 by 30,000, right? That's a, a lot of memory and it's a lot of stuff to calculate. Um, so, but that 
basically that at A x equals B was you know calculated basically from you know this expression for the tangency boundary condition. So it, if you can calculate essentially that tangency boundary condition, you can explicitly calculate the residual without ever having to actually calculate and store the matrix A. So the most expensive portion of that tangent boundary condition is basically calculating this induced velocity that's generated from all of the loops and all of the trailing wakes. So we want to be able to do that quickly um, in order to reduce the computational cost of calculating that residual, which is then used in the GMS algorithm. So we'll see, we're about halfway through. In time. So um, for each loop, we need a loop over all the other loops to calculate induced velocity. So, you know, in general, the solution time would be on order n squares because we have to do this for all the loops. And so each loop sees a loop. You have a loop over all the loops, and inside that, you have a loop over all the loops. So the cost is like n squared. So if you have n loops, you've got z cost. You've got two n loops, you've got four times that cost. You've got four n loops, you've got 16 times that cost. So things grow out of hand quickly. So just doubling your model size from you know, 2,000 to 4,000 panels doesn't double the computational cost, it quadruples it. So how can we speed up these calculations? So if we have some sampling point P, and that would be, say, the centroid of some vortex loop on your geometry, and we have a group of vortex rings out there, that we need to calculate the induced velocity of onto point P. You know, if P is far enough away from G, we can start making some approximations. So we can simplify that group of vortex rings into a large single group of rings with some weighted average of the individual vortex strength, gamma sub i. And now instead of doing six individual evaluations to get the induced velocity at a point P, we do one, right? And so we've just sped that whole process up. Now, of course, it just depends on the fact that P has to be far enough away. If P isn't quote unquote far away, then this would be a poor approximation. As P gets further away, it's going to become a very good approximation. So the algorithm has to define what far away is. You've seen this before in classical aerodynamics, right? So if you got a point P and you got a wing, we can discretize that wing, say as a vortex lattice approximation with a whole bunch of quadrilaterals. We would then then have to loop over all those quads and all of those weight elements to calculate the induced velocity of that point P. But if P is far enough away, we can you know, use a lifting line approximation. Um, and reduce that down to a single lifting line with a simple little iron distribution of the vorticity. If we're even further away, we can reduce that down to a single Hershey vortex. And so we went from a complexity where we had, say, a dozen vortex rings now to a single Hershey vortex. So as long as P is far or very far away, we can reduce the order of the model and reduce the computational complexity. So we have in the solver what we call a grommet multipole. So we have a recursive generation of the coarser panel or VLM models by agglomerating, which just means merging the surface vortex rings. We do this recursively um, for the weights as well as for the geometry itself. And this ends up in basically computational costs that are more like n log n instead of n squared. So if we have our original Skymaster geometry at level one, we had about 7,000 loops. We can merge those loops generate with a coarser model. We have about half the number of loops now in level two. Go down to level three, we've got 2,000 loops. Level four, about 1,600 loops. And there's a diminishing returns here. So level five, it's 1,500 loops. And then that's where we cut it off. All right, so we ended up, we started off with 7,000 loops, and at the course is 1,500 loops. So if you're on a point, either in the flow field or on the body, and you're far enough away, you can start moving down those approximations. And 
do larger and larger approximations as long as you're far enough away. Trolling legs are shed from trolling edges and other separation points. Initially, they're just assumed to be straight lines in the free stream direction. And then during the solution process, we adjust iteratively those wakes so that they lie along stream lines. So if X, Y, and Z are basically the you know, defining points along the, the, uh, the trolling wakes, this is just the definition of a stream line. So dx over dS is just the x component of the velocity over the total. So u over q, and then you have v over q and w over q. So once these you've converged to a solution and the wakes converge to a solution, the wakes are lying along steady state stream lines. So for the sky master, if we what it solve, you basically get pressure distribution. You also get those weights coming off of the vehicle, and the location of those weights have iterated um, such that they're now along streamlines for this geometry. And you can see the weights coming off the tail end of the body, off the struts, and off the wings and tail. Actuator disks. So power model, I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Um, there are a whole bunch of different approaches. Um, we chose to do actuator disk theory um, in VSPRO. Some of these other ones we're actually going to revisit, um, and we, or we have. Um, so the propeller model that's in there right now is Conway's elliptic actuator disk model, uh, tied in with a portion of Johnson's actuator disk model. The, provide the tangential velocity, whereas Conway's provides the axle radial as well as pressure jumped across the disk. And we try to parameterize this in terms of kind of typical engineering input. So you basically obviously need the rotor radius, the location of that rotor, and the thrust direction of that rotor. Then you need power thrust coefficients as well as the RPM. Um, I chart, this is just Conway, is actuator disk model for an elliptically loaded rotor. And then Johnson's actuator disk model where we get the tangential velocities. So questions on any of that? Um, if I don't hear anything, then let's move on. Feel free to ask questions. Okay. Uh, oh, hang on. Let's see. Dave, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, it seems like my mic is working on the other side again as well. Uh, can you back out of this presentation for just a minute? Um, there's a, a few, yeah, see, now we're getting your entire screen. I don't know if maybe it's just the um, presentation aspect ratio that's causing that or uh, what the deal is, but um, I don't know. Can you change the uh, aspect ratio of your slides to, uh, I guess these are what, 4 by 3 or 16 by 9? Yeah, it may uh, screw everything up. Um, not really sure how to do that. Uh, I mean, can you, I, mean, I could do it this way. I, actually, when you just dragged it, when you dragged the bottom below, it got cut off again. So it's not just in presentation mode. If if you want to do what you're doing here, if you if you drag the bottom corner up about, you know, half an inch, um, then, yeah, now we've got the full slide. All right, well, let's just do it this way because I'm pretty sure if we muck with the acid ratio, it's going to hose all these sides. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, at least it, this way we can see everything. So, um, it's uh, someone asked online if the actuator disk model assumes a certain flow orientation or uh, if uh, how it feeds that in. Yeah, so the actuator disk model, both of them basically assume, they're, they're really for propellers, and so they're really assuming the flow is coming in normal to the actuator disk. Um, there are some corrections in there. So, you know, if you're at some small angle of attack, it does basically calculate the component that's normal, you know, so to the actuator disk. Um, but at high angles of attack, or for instance, if you tried using the rotor, the, the, that actuator just model in there to model edgewise flow on a, on a helicopter, it did it run, but it'll be wrong. Okay, thanks. And if I remember from the um, 
VSPRO input file, you can set whatever the normal vector for that actuator disk is, can't you? Yeah, yeah. When that comes out, I mean, when when the GUI goes through, it generates all that information, right? So, um, so you're given it basically the location of you know that actuator disk, and like you said, the vector that points in the thrust direction of that actuator disk, um, and so it's using that thrust direction basically to define, you know, the normal of that actuator disk. And so if the free stream is not coming in, it does a dot product of that to calculate the component of the free stream that's normal to the actuator disk. But that's an approximation that's going to break down the larger the angle is. Um, and certainly if you're doing, like I said, edgewise flow, where you're using, trying to use that model for a helicopter rotor, it's just, that's just going to be wrong. All right. Thanks um, a lot, Dave. Uh, we got about... You're going to get some downwash, but really it's not, yeah. Okay. It's just... <laughs> uh, we've got about 20 minutes here until noon when uh, Justin will take over for his GUI demo. So uh, we'll go ahead and just get back to your talks. All right. So let me take this one. Let me know if that works out. Is that cut off at the bottom or can you see it? Cuts off the very bottom, make it a little shorter. Yeah, that looks great. All right. Um, so validation. <clears throat> so we're just gonna look at a couple different cases here. Uh, and we'll just step through and save some time. So high aspect ratio wing. So we basically uh, looked at a number of different uh, simple Hershey bar wings, very the aspect ratio from one to twenty. Um, and you get kind of the typical behavior that you'd expect, um, you know, in terms of the lift curve slope as well as the induced drag. The nice thing is that, you know, from theory, you can reduce this all down to a single aspect ratio. So if you own Eben Mendelhoff, it's like one of the first charts in the entire book um, where they basically have experimental data and they reduce it all down to an aspect ratio of five, right? And so as you get to higher aspect ratios, you expect that the lift curve slope basically is going to collapse to a you know, single line, which it does as we get into the higher aspect ratios. And then the induced drag uh, collapses, um, you know, all down to a, a single drag core. Um, and so that's just kind of a validation that at least, you know, from a linear theory on a very simple geometry that, you know, you're getting things right. And if you can't get that right, then back up. Um, so minimum reduced drag, uh, so for theory, you know, for a high aspect ratio wing, it's going to basically correspond to an elliptical loading. Uh, so I think um, Ronald talked about uh, design optimization yesterday using uh, DS files. So we started with an untwisted wing and we allow an optimizer to minimize the induced drag of the configuration with some design variables, basically mean the twist distribution over the entire wing. So we just had eight twist design variables, uh, with simple Python strip, script driving over from the VSP. Um, and then we had a, just a simple uh, conjugate gradient optimization type routine also written in Python driving all this. So the Basically, the loading here is the CLC versus span. So the baseline Hershey bar wing untwisted is the red and the optimized shape where we're just basically trying to tell it to minimize the induced drag is in green and then an elliptic loading would be the blue. And so you can see just even with eight that it's doing what you would expect. It's trying to drive it towards a elliptic loading. Um, and so, you know, optimizers are good at two things, optimizing and finding bugs. Um, so, you know, in this case, it, it actually optimized in the direction we wanted. Um, more often than not, it goes in some other direction, which tells you you've got a mistake in your code. Uh, supersonic delta wings, we mentioned that at least for the vortex lattice code portion of the solver, you can actually do subsonic as well as supersonic analyses. Um, so we looked at a whole bunch of different supersonic delta wing configurations. Um, here we got 45 and 65 degree sweeps at a range of different Mach numbers. The neat thing is that there's a bunch of theory out there for supersonic 
delta wings. Um, and it turns out that you know if you reduce everything down and plot basically a you know function m squared and the tangent of the sweep and CL times tangent of the sweep, that the, the theory basically says that all of this should basically collapse down to you know a single curve. And if you do that with experimental data, it actually does. Um, and we did the same collapse of data um, for the solution that you saw in the previous chart for, from VS Bureau for both the 65 and the 45. And again, they both basically dropped down onto you know, that, that same curve there that you see. And I should say that experimental data covers a whole bunch of different sweeps as well um, and mock numbers. So the propeller modeling. Um, so we'll just talk about the model that we had done. I had done in the past this morning. It was NASA's uh, DEP distributed electric propulsion vehicle that we did some analysis and testing on. Um, I was listening yesterday. Somebody asked about control surfaces. I'll just mention it here. Um, Rob had mentioned one way to model control surfaces in VSP arrow, well, an open VSP that gets pulled over into VSP arrow, um, basically doing the subsurfaces. Um, you can certainly do that, um, and that will carry over to the vortex lattice model. It does not currently carry over into the panel model that's work in progress. But for both the vortex lattice model as well as for the panel model, you are free to actually go in and model control surfaces as completely separate components. And so here we have the high lift system modeled up. And so that's going to be carried over into either a panel or a vortex lattice model. So here we have the vortex lattice model. We've got way too many propellers modeled. Um, and you know, as we had talked about, we basically got you know potato chip wing for both you know the wing and the control uh, the, the high lift system as well as the wings and tails and the cruciform for the body. Um, just the solution on that. So all those rotors are running, they're all affecting the solution. They're certainly affecting the location of the wakes, um, as you can kind of see there. All of that twisting of the wakes is because of the swirl of the rotors. And I should say they're all counterclockwise, so that every other rotor is going the other direction. And then it's symmetric left and right um, in terms of the rotors. Um, there was actually some. Uh, higher fidelity analyses done on this. So the upper left is looking at CL. This is in the blown configuration. So we've got basically uh, fun 3D. We've got, uh, and there we've got star CCM, which was run. Um, and then we got VSP arrow. And so obviously VSP arrow is not going to predict the stall. So it just kind of keeps marching up as the angle of attack increases. But, you know, in terms of predicting the blown CL, it's, you know, for as simple of a model it is, it's not doing so bad. Um, and the lower is the unblown, it's comparing the Aspira and the star CCM results. And so, you know, for the unblown, we do, you know, as well um, as to be expected for the geometry. And then over in the upper right there is the pitching moment, and that chart actually has both sets. So the lower set, um, you've got uh, the unblown. Um, on, on the top there, sorry, and then you've got the balloon cases down below. And so for VS Piro, we have both the balloon and unballoon, um, and, and then comparing against STAR. Um, again, not only are we, you know, are we getting the CL reasonably well in terms of the delta between balloon and unballoon, but we're getting pitching moment as well. And then this is just looking at the, the loading along the wing. So, um, and the upper one is just the unloaded wing um, with you know unpowered unblown wing, I should say, um, comparing to Spiro and Star. And then the lower one is the powered case. Um, and so, I mean, there's certainly differences between the two solvers, but in general, uh, VS Pero is capturing you know the trends that you see there in terms of the blowing effects of all the different rotors. Actually, this, this is on one wing, so this is on the outboard starboard wing from zero. From root to tip. We got 10 minutes. Uh, stability control. So this is just a model that I've had for years. 
Uh, it's an F-15 active flight vehicle. Uh, it was actually flight tested. Um, it's Mach 0.5, 3.2 degrees angle attack, and we're comparing actually against flight test data. Can't share the flight test data, um, but uh, in general, for this configuration, which is fairly complex, and again, running in the Vortex Autos model shown here, um, CO Alpha, you know, we're in, you know, the 15% range of uncertainty there in, in terms of errors. Um, CO Alpha is actually doing, you know, reasonably well. I usually think it would be the other way around. CMQ, which is, you know, the damping, we're a little bit low, and CM Beta a little bit high. So that's it for my charts this morning. So open to questions. Okay. Um, Dave, we did just have a question on whether or not the uh, actuator disks will model windmilling effects. Can you put in, um, I think, negative thrust coefficient is how that would be implemented? I can't remember if I had tried that before or not. So uh, you can do it and it'll run, but I, yeah, I you know I don't know if it's gonna do it, what it's gonna do. <laughs> not, not, a, not, a, not a not a test case that I had considered, to be honest. But yeah, I, I'm pretty sure you can probably put in the negative thrust and it, it'll run. But um, yeah, I mean, if if you just look at the way the assumptions in the model go, you know, it's wrong. Um, it's it's assuming an actuator disc, it's assuming you know a helical vortex coming off of that that's going in the direction of the flow, not opposite the direction of the flow. Um, that helical vortex is basically, you know, part of that is essentially driven by the RPM and the free stream velocity, um, right? So the advance ratio. Um, so if you start basically flying this in reverse, it's it's just gonna be wrong. So I'm sure it'll probably run but I, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. And we had someone ask, um, just in your opinion, is there a case that would benefit more from panel mode versus VLM? Um, if, is there a particular reason to choose panel mode over VLM and what case that might be? Um, yeah, I think there's two reasons to go back and forth between one or the other. Generally speaking, the Panel method is, I mean, you're kind of doubling the number of, of panels like if you just think of a wind you're doing top and bottom. So in general, the panel model takes longer to run. Um, and, and there's other issues there too. So just generally computationally, it, it, it's just gonna cost you more time. So if time is of importance, uh, you know, consider the vortex lattice model first, because it will probably run much faster. Um, the times to go to the panel method, I think, really are where you know there's going to be configurations out there that are just very complex, and if you try to represent them as cruciform bodies and potato chip wings and tails, you're just doing yourself a disservice. You're not going to be able to model some of these geometries that way. Um, you know, if you're doing a wing and tube, or you know. You know, while flying wing, then the vortex lattice method is, is going to do great. If you've got three patents out in an overwing nacelle configuration and you're trying to model an overwing nacelle, that's probably not going to work very well in, you know, the vortex lattice model. So, you know, geometry complexity, you know, sometimes it, you get to the point where you just can't really model it correctly. The other one is... Thickness effects are of importance, right? So if you've got a bunch of nacelles right next to each other and you you know you're worrying about the details of the flow between those, so you've got an F-18 with a you know a bunch of stores and fuel tanks, and you're you're really worrying about you know the loads on those and the flow in between those, the thickness is going to be very important. So just reducing it down to a cruciform body is not going to give you the right physics. Um, and so in those cases, um, you know, you need to go to a panel method. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Dave. Uh, really appreciate that time. Uh, we've got a few minutes here before our uh, new demonstration by Justin Gravitt from ES Arrow. 
So for a few minutes here, we're going to go into standby and um, we're just going to let things hold for a little bit. And then right at noon, we're going to start that presentation on schedule for everybody watching online. Um, thanks a lot for uh, sticking with us and tuning in. I hope you guys are getting a lot out of these. And uh, we'll be right back at noon and we'll start up with the next demo. Thanks a lot.